The first is, if you want them to stay alive, not very. Um, space is really bad for you. There's no air to breathe, it's really cold, and there's lots of nasty radiation around that we're protected from by the atmosphere. There are also bits of meteorite and all sorts flying around that would kill you. So, unless you have a spacesuit or a spacecraft, you would not last very, very long. It's not like in the movies you wouldn't kind of explode, it wouldn't be quite that gruesome, you'd freeze to death and you'd run out of air and suffocate. Which is not nice. If, you, if that did happen, you would still fly through space forever until you hit something. So if we threw you into space fast enough, you could escape the solar system forever and travel through the stars forever until the end of the universe, unless you hit something. In terms of staying alive in space, which is probably more relevant, you want to stay alive, so you'd have a spacesuit. Astronomers in spacesuits on the space station typically stay out of the space station for a few hours at most because their spacesuit can only hold so much air, so much food, and they need to go to the toilet and things. And doing that in a spacesuit is not particularly pleasant. They do have ways of doing it, but you don't really want to be in there for days and weeks. <laughs> if you're in a space station, that's like having a house, like having a school. They've got cooking facilities, they have food up there, they have toilets, so they can stay up there for a really long time. The longest any person stayed on a space station is about a year. Now, there are problems with this. You don't feel the effects of gravity in the space station because you're in free fall. And so what that means is that your bones don't have anything pulling you down, and so they start to waste away, which is why astronauts spend a lot of their time doing exercise to try and keep their muscle strength up and their bone strength up because they will one day come back down to the Earth. They're also exposed to lots of nasty radiation because even the metal walls of the space station aren't enough to prevent the radiation hitting them. So it's not good for them to spend too long there, which is why they come down eventually. What we're trying to do is trying to push that longest time people are staying in space longer and longer. As scientists understand better what happens to the human body under weightlessness, under low gravity, with all that radiation. Because obviously the really long-term goal, maybe in our lifetimes, maybe beyond that, is to start moving humanity off the Earth and to colonize the rest of the solar system, the rest of the universe. That's what we'd like to do. Because what happens if something happens on Earth to wipe out life on the Earth? A mass extinction like happened to the dinosaurs. Well, if we're all on Earth, we get hit by it. But if we have people elsewhere in space, then humanity will survive. So it's a really good idea, potentially long in the future, to maybe try and colonize other planets. But to do that, we've got to take baby steps. We've got to look at how we can live in space. We've got to build that technology and build our understanding to make it as safe as possible for people. So we're working towards that. How far can New Horizons travel? We've launched New Horizons into space so quickly that it will escape from the sun's gravity and travel among the stars forever. So if I throw this up, it will come back down. The Earth's gravity pulls it back down. But the harder I throw it, the further it will go. And if the ceiling wasn't there, I could get it quite high. If I threw it fast enough, it would never fall back down. I throw it so fast, gravity couldn't pull it down. It would escape from the Earth. And then it would fly around the sun. And the sun's gravity is stronger than the Earth, so could the keep it, you have to go really quick to escape from the sun, but New Horizons is travelling that quick. It travelled to Pluto, which is four and a half thousand million kilometres away, in just nine and a half years. It passed Pluto travelling at 14 kilometres per second. And that's too quick even for the sun to pull it back. So New Horizons will travel throughout our galaxy, unless it hits something forever. So it will go thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of light years from the Earth. A light year is a distance light would travel in one year. Light travels to the moon in one second. 300,000 kilometers a second, so you can imagine how big a light year is. New Horizons will keep going forever. New Horizons is really exciting. It's a spacecraft we launched back in 2005. It's only taken nine and a half years to reach Pluto, and it only spent 40 hours within 1 million kilometers of Pluto. Because it's so far away, the information it's sending back is coming back at a real trickle. The rate at which data is coming back is much slower than you can get it on the internet. It's slower than I had the internet when I was 14 or 15. It's one kilobit per second. So what that means is we can only get a few photographs back from New Horizons per day. It got about three gigabytes worth of information in that 40 hours it was close to Pluto. That will take 16 months to get back to us because that data link is so small. And that's just because New Horizons is so far away, 
remember, four and a half thousand million kilometers and getting further at 14 kilometers every second. And it has so little power. It's only got 20 watts of power to do everything. So it can't send a strong signal back. So it take a long time for us to get all the information back. But it's already made incredible discoveries. We've seen geological activity on Pluto. <laughs> evidence that it's had resurfacing, volcanism with ices. Evidence that Pluto has an atmosphere that will freeze back to the surface as Pluto moves away from the sun. Really exciting information. NASA are really, really good at getting their information out to the public. So any of you can go to the New Horizons webpage, um, which we can find later on. And all of the latest photos and discoveries are on there every single day. NASA's brilliant at that. So they sent home some of the really eye-catching picture postcard photos first, and they're now getting lots of data back that will keep scientists busy for years. How many constellations there are? Well, we're going to go through the constellations in the talk, but constellations are just patterns of stars in the sky that we've grouped together to tell stories. And every culture, every society made different patterns out of the same stars. And when we get to your activity, you'll see an example of that. In terms of the constellations that we use as professional astronomers, it's a bit like the countries on the Earth. We use them to denote areas in the sky so we know where things are, where, so we know where the interesting things we want to look at are. And we have an agreed list of 88 constellations that are based on the constellations used by the Greeks a couple of thousand years ago in the Northern Hemisphere, and the ones devised by Northern Hemisphere colonists who moved to the Southern Hemisphere about 200 years ago, who put the Southern stars into patterns as well. So they're based on European constellations, particularly Greek constellations from a long time ago. Every culture and every tribe will have different constellations, different stories. So there are as many constellations among the people on the Earth as there probably are people on the Earth. But we use this list of 88 official ones just to make our lives easier. And they're the ones I'll talk about because they're the ones I'm most familiar with. But we should recognize that the indigenous people who lived on this land, the Aboriginal people who live locally here, will have had one set of constellations. Your ancestors came from totally different parts all over the world, who have grown up generations ago with their own constellations. And they're just patterns made out of the points of light in the night sky that we can use to tell stories and to help say things about the way the world works. So a supernova is what you get when a star much bigger, much more massive than our sun comes to the end of its life. And that star turns hydrogen into helium in its core. That's when it's burning, shining. For the most massive stars, they can turn helium into carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, making all of the elements that are in us right now. We are made of material that was cooked in stars that went supernova before the Earth was formed. We are stardust. Those most massive stars make everything up to iron. And the problem with iron is you can't bang that together and make heavier things and create energy. You have to use energy to do that. So all of a sudden, when those stars have made iron, they run out of fuel. And they run out of fuel very abruptly. And that causes them to explode. That's what a supernova is. It's the very biggest stars detonating, blowing off all their outer layers in an explosion so bright that they outshine on their own the other stars in the, their galaxy all added together. Now our Milky Way galaxy has 400 million stars, give or take. When one of them dies as a supernova, it is brighter than the light from all the other 399,999,999 stars all added together <coughs> for a period of several months. It's an insanely big explosion, and in that explosion, all the material from the outer layers of the star are flung off to go into the next generation of young stars and planets to form, possibly, more life like us. All of the carbon in your bodies was made in a previous generation of stars. Which is very cool. The planets in our solar system, of which we have eight, vary in size. Jupiter is the biggest. Jupiter is 318 times the mass of the Earth, and it's so big that you could put our Earth inside it more than 1,300 times and still have room left over. If you look at a photo of Jupiter, you'll see that there's a big red storm, a big red weather system on it called the Great Red Spot. And that's the biggest weather system we know of in the solar system, and that storm is twice the width of the Earth. So Jupiter's the biggest planet. 
The smallest of the eight planets is Mercury, and Mercury is about half the size of the Earth. So that's the range of the planets. The dwarf planets, things like Pluto, are smaller still. They're smaller than our moon. So the reason we put the line there and said these are planets, these are dwarf planets, these are asteroids, is to help us understand the solar system. And now there's an obvious gap between Mercury, the smallest planet, and Pluto and Ceres, the biggest dwarf planets, where there's a big difference in size. But we're essentially doing the same thing we do with humans. Everybody in this room, be it me, be it you, be it your teachers, are people. But we break people up into different categories to make life easier. We have children, we have adults, we have old people, retirees. There isn't really much difference between a person who's 15 years and 11 months old and somebody who's just had a 16th birthday. But we say one of them's an adult and one of them's a child. We put that division there to make life easier, to help us understand things, to say that this group of people should be in school, this group of people should be working, and this group of people can retire. And it's the same thing with the planets. We've actually got a spread of objects of all different sizes, but to better understand them, we break them up into groups that have lots of common properties to make everything work. And that's why we have eight planets, many dwarf planets, and lots of debris. In terms of how many moons there are in the solar system, again, it depends where you put the line. So the rings of Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune are made up of bits of debris. Boulders, things up to the size of this room, and there are millions of those to make the rings. So one answer would be millions. If we instead say that moons aren't simply <coughs> having rings, but they have to be bigger than a few kilometers across as a lump, then the number drops hugely to hundreds or thousands. We don't know the exact answer, we're still finding more of them. Jupiter and Saturn are having a race. As we get better telescopes, we find more moons. Some years, Jupiter has more moons than Saturn, and then we find a few more around Saturn, and a few more around Jupiter. At last count, I think Jupiter was just winning with 67. But don't quote me on that. If you go onto Wikipedia, if you go onto one of the NASA websites, you can find the latest numbers as of today, but you might find that in a year's time, those numbers have increased. But there are certainly hundreds of moons. As for how big our solar system is, it's again a question of where you put the boundary line. Like how do you say how big Mullum is? Do you say it's where the gardens finish from the houses? Or do you say it's where the council district goes? Or do you put a line somewhere? So we've got to say what we mean by our solar system. If we mean just the planets, then Neptune is the outermost planet. It's 30 times further from the sun than we are which works out at something like um, four and a half billion kilometers distant, roughly. But that's very nearby. Our sun is holding to it a swarm of comets, a swarm of dirty snowballs left behind from when the planets formed. And for me, this is where the outer side, outer part of the solar system really is. The outer place that the sun is in control rather than other stars. And that reaches out as far as 100,000 times further from the sun than the Earth is. That's a long, long way. But all the planets are just within that 30 AU zone, 30 times further from the sun than we are. So it really depends where you put the limit. Some people who look at the sun's atmosphere, the cell of wind that's blowing past the planets, would say somewhere between 100 and 200 times further from the sun than we are. So that's where the wind from the sun hits a gas of space and forms a shock. That's the average of the atmosphere, really. So we're kind of, in a way, in the sun's atmosphere, just in the very, 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 very tenuous parts so it doesn't really have an effect on us. In terms of what materials are used to make a space probe, it's the same thing as you'd make a car, as you'd make things like that from, but really high technology stuff. So New Horizons is a good example. New Horizons has a big satellite dish on it, about two meters across. And that's what points back to Earth, about one meter across actually, sends all the data back. It's then got a little generator in it, a little engine. Now, it's not like a car engine burning petrol, it's a nuclear engine. It's radioactive, and it's plutonium. That's radioactive decaying to create energy. Then it's got instruments, little science devices built into it, built into a body that's built of metal. So it's got computers in it, it's got little telescopes, it's got all sorts of science equipment, but the basic materials, the metals, the rare earths that go in the computers are the same as we make cars from, computers from, desks from, and buildings from. Mainly metal rather than wood, because they have to be pretty strong, 
but the same kind of materials are used. <coughs> In terms of how long it takes to make a probe, it's a long time. So, New Horizons was launched in 2005. They started planning the mission about a decade before that. The actual construction, build-up, preparation will have taken five, six, seven years, and of course a huge amount of money. Something like five to seven hundred million dollars. Now that sounds like a lot of money, but this was made in the US where they've got more than, is it 200 million people, something like that? which means it's actually only maybe $3 per person. Which, when you compare to the amount of money the government spend on other things, like the military, like on welfare, all these different things that are very, very important cost a lot more than the space probes. The space probes are actually fairly cheap on a person-by-person -person basis. And they don't just give us the esoteric kind of magical pictures that we want to see. The technologies developed for them are really cutting edge, so they trickle down to day-to-day -day life. They help improve everything. The technologies developed for astronomy instruments, for space probes, for telescopes, are eventually used further down the line in hospitals, helping improve people's health. So there's a lot of benefits from that investment in what looks a fairly extravagant thing to do. You think, that's a lot of money, but it's actually something that will have long-term benefits. Um, why can't we see dark matter? Well, that's a really difficult question. And um, the real answer is we don't really know. So this is one thing about science that's really cool. You ask questions all the time. The most exciting questions are the ones you can't answer yet. Because that means you've got a problem you have to solve. So we know that there is dark matter out there because we can see its effects. We can see that things are moving through space under the influence of gravity that is a gravitational pull from material that we cannot observe. That's why we call it dark matter, it's dark, we can't see it. We don't yet know exactly what it is. Different people have different theories, and those theories get very abstract and complicated. But those theories make predictions. They say that if my theory is true, then when we get a better telescope, you will see this. If my theory is true, then when you turn the Large Hadron Collider on in Switzerland and put enough energy in, you'll discover this particle. So they're the predictions, and that's how we test the theory. And we're getting closer to having an idea what dark matter is and why we can't see it. The simple answer, though, is that it doesn't interact with the light that we used to see by. Light would pass through it, so we have no way of seeing it. Can we see the air in this room at the minute? No. no. But we know it's there because we're still breathing. If we're out on a clear day and there's a wind blowing, can we see the wind? No. no. But we can feel it. We can feel our hair blowing, so we know it's there. For a long time, people didn't understand what the wind was because you can't see it, you can't touch it, but you feel its effect. And it took a long time until we understood the way the atmosphere works, the way that molecules in the air move. Dark matter's like modern science's wind. We know it's there, we see its effects, but we can't quite explain it yet. So if you ask me the question again in 10 years' time, I'd probably have a slightly different answer because science will have moved on. As for how Uranus got its rings, it's probably the same as how Saturn, Jupiter, and Neptune got theirs. Saturn's actually the one with the really spectacular rings, but each of the giant planets has a ring system. And we're not entirely sure how they came about. There's a few possible explanations. All the rings are really close into the planets, and they're so close in that the tide that the planet pulls on the moons with would pull them apart. So one possibility is that those planets have moons, that were so close to the planet, they were pulled apart into fragments, into debris, and those are the rings we see. And that's quite possible. Another explanation is maybe that a comet or a big antsy object came near the planets, was captured and torn apart, and that gave the rings that we see as well. Because so even though Saturn's rings, which are the most spectacular, are made of uncountable millions and millions of boulders, some as big as this room, some down to the size of my hand or smaller, you don't need a very big object, only a few tens of kilometers, maybe 100 kilometers across, to be torn apart to make that much debris. And so it could just be that a comet was torn apart or a moon was smashed to make the rings, and they're there now as the evidence. Now, astronomy, as a science, is a bit like a detective story. With biology, with physics, with chemistry, you can do experiments. And you do them in the classroom, right? You get something in a bowl, look around with it, and see what happens. With astronomy, the things we're looking at are so far away 
We can do experiments. We can't put Mars in a ditch and hit it with a hammer and see what happens. We can only look. So we're like detectives. All the things that have happened to put the universe where it is now, how it is now, have happened in the past. What we see now are the clues, the evidence that points to that story. And it's all very muddled. So we look through telescopes, we look through spacecraft, we build up clues, and we use those clues to inform our stories, our theories of how the universe works. And as we get more information, we can test those theories, and when those theories prove incorrect, we can build better ones. So it really is a detective story, where detectives try to understand how the universe works. So if we get some more questions. To take the fuel with you to come back would be pretty much impossible for us at the minute. It's beyond our technological ability. Further down the line, we'll be able to, or a long way down the line. Now, it's like any exploration. The first people who moved to the US from Europe when we had the wave of colonization that went out in the early 1600s did a one-way trip. It was just too expensive, too difficult to get them back. They went for a wide variety of reasons, but they knew they were going on a one-way trip. It was dangerous. We live in a society these days that people describe as risk averse. And what that means is we're scared of the consequences of things. It's why we have health and safety and you have to be careful what experiments you do in the classroom now compared to what your parents did. And it's partially because we get so much TV and news that we're aware of the dangers. So people are very worried about sending people to Mars as a one-way trip when they know that they'll die there. But the thing is, if you left them on Earth, they would die eventually anyway. Yeah. Yeah. It happens. Now, the people who are choosing to go on Mars want whether or not it actually happens in the end. Fully aware of the risks, yeah. and have been very brave, they're explorers. And exploration always has risks. That's a good question. Yeah? How is the center of the Earth? We can't see all the rocks in the way of us. In order to explain the things that we detect with the clues, with earthquakes, with seismic waves going through, with volcanoes, we think it's probably five or 6,000 degrees, something like that. Maybe a bit cooler, maybe a bit hotter. I'm not sure exactly the numbers because it's a long time since I looked into it. But nobody's exactly sure. But we know a fair few things about it. We know the Earth has a magnetic field, you know, which makes your magnets point in a certain direction. The other thing we can explain that is if the core has a liquid part. The iron is liquid, so that we know that the core must be hot enough to melt iron. But we also know that there's a huge weight of rock and metal on top of it, which makes it a higher pressure. And as you increase the pressure on something, the temperature you need to melt it gets higher and higher. So we can work out kind of what temperature it is by knowing that because we have this magnetic field, we must have a liquid part of the core, liquid iron, to move around to create the magnetic field. So that's a very clever way that we can guess the temperature based on the evidence we have. But we've never been able to drill down and measure it directly. Yeah. Um, We always do exploration at the very cutting edge of what we can achieve. And the Apollo missions were very courageous, very dangerous things. Um, Apollo astronauts died during the process. The early, so Apollo 11 was the first one to land on the moon. Apollo 8 was the first one to orbit the moon, I think. They moved their step by step around a bit further, improving things. One of the early Apollo test missions, so it might be one of the Gemini missions, the astronauts burnt to death horrifically on the, run, on the launch pad. Because initially, they know that there's no air in space. You need a strong thing to keep the air in the capsule. To lower the pressure, they have an atmosphere of pure oxygen in the capsule, which means you can have lower pressure, less stress on the metal. Problem with a pure oxygen atmosphere is a single spark, and everything burns. So there were a lot of dangers involved in going to the moon. Apollo 13 nearly didn't make it back and was the cause of a very famous Hollywood movie. It is possible to get to the moon with very little computing power on the probes. But the same way that you, you think about the aircraft we fly today and all the technology involved with them, and you say, how did people fly 100 years ago? 
they had air traffic that was simpler. And they relied a lot on the pilots. And Apollo missions relied a lot on the pilots, relied a lot on communication back to the Earth, and did a lot with very little. And that required a lot of skill, but it was feasible. Let's do a Cool. Yeah? How are things to Um, Probably about 150 to 200 degrees below freezing of the cloud tops. The deeper you go down in the clouds, the warmer it will get. Uranus probably has an icy rocky core really deep down with huge layers of clouds thicker than the Earth is wide above it. So the deeper down you go, the hotter it will get. And the cloud tops are probably about 200 below freezing, because it's nearly 20 times further from the sun than we are, which means it only gets one four hundredth as much energy. So light spreads out as it moves outwards. So it doesn't get much heat from the sun at all, and it's really, really chilly. Yep. Actually took the moon. Would ABS send like information back photos and things so we actually know that? <laughs> <laughs> and that's what they did. They sent messages back with radio waves, just the same as we get radio transmissions from satellites, from televisions, from New Horizons, which is far, far further away than the moon. They had cameras on the moon lander. They had cameras on the orbiter. Took photos. There are some very famous photos of the Earth looking back from the moon when the astronauts in the orbit are looking back at the Earth. So they got the information back with radio waves, just the same as we communicate, just the same as our TV signals come through to our houses through the dishes on our roofs. Same communication, just 50 years ago, a little bit less advanced. I know I've been reading a bit about one that they sent up and they've lost contact with, but every now and then they get a little bit of Feel contact. It. Right. And they can start up some yep. of the controls remotely. Yes. But they've just got to let it run its course. Yeah. So can you tell the maybe talk to us a little bit about how they're powered and yes. what they need to consider when they're designing one? So depending where you're going in the solar system, you have to design your tool appropriately. So you don't go fishing with a hammer and you don't repair a car with a fishing net, right? You make the right tool for the job. For most of the spacecraft we send in the inner solar system, to planets like Mercury, Venus, Mars, and to the comet Churyama for Asimenko, where Phila is, you're near enough to the sun that solar energy is abundant. And so those spacecraft usually have solar panels. And so that's a good source of fuel. For New Horizons, that doesn't work. New Horizons is currently 35 times further from the sun than we are, which means it gets only one one thousandth of the sunlight. Solar panels just wouldn't work. You don't get enough energy. So you needed a different tool. So New Horizons is powered by a radioactive generator. What they use is plutonium, which is a byproduct of radioactive nuclear power stations on Earth that is one of the things we find very hard to dispose of. It's a very radioactive substance. But it's got a small amount of that in New Horizons in a very, very powerful generator that generates about 20 watts of power. Now that doesn't sound like very much. I mean, these light bulbs are much, use much more power than that, just like a classroom. But with that 20 watts of power, the scientists building the probe have been very careful. That powers a computer with a dish drive for large enough to store gigabytes of data. And it also powers seven scientific instruments, which took all the photos, all the images you've seen from Pluto, lots of other cool science data, and the dish that points back to Earth. Now that great distance and that low power, 20 watts of power, is why the data from New Horizon is coming back so slowly. So we only get one kilobit per second back, which means that the three gigabytes of data that New Horizons took during the 40 hours it was closest to Pluto will take 16 months to be returned to Earth because the bandwidth is so low. So it's like, I don't know, trying to watch the internet through the old dial-up modems that I grew up with, where you've got a really low data rate. You click on a picture like these beautiful images I've got here, and you see it load line by line. That's what they're getting permission control from New Horizons. Yeah. Yeah. Uranus is like four times wider than the Earth, so maybe 40 or 50,000 kilometers across. And it's a bit more massive than the Earth as well. And it will amuse you all to know that Uranus is mainly made of methane. 